theatre director are just a few of those who talk of the teacher who changed their lives. I vowed and declared that I would try and help New Zealand to be more of a community uh, climatised to art. And I've spent all my life trying to do that, trying to get art into the community. For those of us that she's touched, she is a mentor, really, and a person that represents bravery in art. I think she is a, a great craftswoman herself. And I think that she's one of the few people we have got in New Zealand that's truly original. She's still rips full scale into fun. She's like a little girl at a birthday party. She approaches life as an adventure. At 65, despite having suffered a stroke, Yvonne Russ still pots, paints and runs summer schools. During a long career, Yvonne's greatest contribution to the development of art in this country has been her skill as a teacher, inspiring generations of New Zealand artists. Born in Whangarei in 1922, Yvonne grew up as the only white child in isolated northern communities like Tihapua. She came from a family whose teaching careers spanned four generations. My father was a sort of missionary teaching a headmaster of Maori school and he just gave his entire life to the Maoris and he taught me how to teach. Coming from Christchurch, Yvonne's mother, a talented silversmith, never felt comfortable in the wilds of Northland, but she stimulated in her daughter a love of art. My mother had been an art teacher and once she married, and went up to live amongst the Maori, she never did art again. She was a very good artist. And New Zealand just wasn't ready for artists to live in the community and work in the community. And she helped me to really get into art, because in my day there was no aspect teachers. So I grew up amongst the Maoris, and they have a pack system in which the eldest teach the youngest how to grow up and you do this through adventure. The 14 year olds will take you to the sea, the beach, the trees, the caves, the mountains and the hills and the youngest paddle along behind and slowly they grow used to it and well I joined the gang. I was surrounded by people from childhood and they were outsiders, they weren't the family, and they were outsiders, and therefore I've always de dealt with lots of people and had lots of people in my studio. And it's been like a commune all the time, as all through my life, because I get gregarious and I go out into the, to meet those people. And I want them, I need them. There were a thousand people at Tehapu, it was very isolated and the parents had to work extremely hard and they were under stress and they were teachers, they were headmasters, they boarded seven teachers and every problem was dull and every problem came to our house. But meeting all the needs of an isolated community with no electricity, no jobs and TB running right proved too stressful for the Rust family. They transferred to Te Awamutu, where once she was established at the high school, Yvonne began to seriously consider a career in art. There was no art taught in schools, but the geography master had an interest, and he taught us to draw, and he gave us paints to paint with, and at one stage he found me an ancient book on perspective, and, but I had to work out how it was done from the book. But had it not been for the art surrounding me at home and my parents being able to help me, I could never have done it. And it was to Christchurch she came as a student 48 years ago. It's a changed city, a new environment, tourists in place of buses and cars.
an art center in place of the Canterbury College where she trained. The university has moved out to Ireland. As there were no fine arts degrees in 1940, her parents insisted she get a diploma that would enable her to teach, and Christchurch was the only place she could. It was here that she met Bill Sutton, now one of her oldest friends. He has become one of New Zealand's leading artists. His 1950 Norwester in the Cemetery has become a classic. He painted the later Plantation Fields in 1986. Yvonne has a special place in his memories of their student days. As a girl in the art school here, she never drew anything small, she never drew anything delicately. She seized a great lump of charcoal on a big sheet of paper and drew vigorously. And the images that came out of it were great fun. They get us all uh, quite a stir up because most of us were fairly cautious about what we did, but Yvonne never. Right from the start, she was a, a vigorous performer. This particular room, the life class room, I remember Bill first in this room because he came to time studies on Friday nights. He was much senior to me and we kept looking at his paintings to see how good they were <laughs> to try and emulate him. Yvonne graduated, fulfilling her parents' wishes and became the fifth generation of rust teachers. It was a career that was to influence so many of today's artists. She's been a, a sort of midwife for the arts, if I may use a very old expression. But with her, it certainly does apply. All sorts of people owe Yvonne a tremendous amount. People who had nothing to start with, she developed a sense of purpose in and gave them something to work for and live for. And many of them have succeeded in the arts. Well, when I began teaching, it was hard because I more or less trained people I shouldn't. And then I realized that art was so hard to make a living at that only those that really loved it would want to do it and would be able to hang on through their lives. And so it wasn't really wise to train anybody who, to a, a higher standard unless they were gifted, really gifted. Many of her students did go on to become full-time professionals, not only in the visual arts, but as performing artists as well. One of her students, who had that special gift, has in turn moulded the careers of another generation of artists. He's been seen in rare television performances as a chic. I wear contact lenses. There's no money in here, nothing. Sit down top record company executive. What the hell are you doing? Just shut up and listen to it. grocery shop owner. Bought a wee something for the lad. Will he be all right? Just rest and then he'll be okay. But he's more commonly known for his talent as director and teacher. Mercury Theatre's artistic director, Raymond Hawthorne, who came under Yvonne's watchful eye at Hastings High School. She definitely thought I should work in the theatre. She definitely didn't think I should paint or um, be connected in the fine arts in any way. Although I had this huge desire to do so, and I remember having an enormous row with her um, when I decided, instead of sitting at the university entrance, that I wanted to get my preliminary diploma of fine arts, and she kept on saying, but you haven't got the talent to do it. You're just not good enough. And I kept on saying, yes, but I want to. And so she conceded, and I did get my preliminary diploma of fine arts, and it was a hard struggle. A true artist is a person who wants to to work at it all the time, not just in fits and starts. A true artist is a person who works at it for 19 hours a day. Yvonne somehow seemed to manage to sort of take individuals, support us, and push us in the right direction at, at the given time. 
And I think this is the major thing that influenced, you know, she influenced with us, that was, was finding each one of us and sort of saying, I think you should be doing this, and I think you should paint, and I think your talent lies towards the theatre, and you should do this, and you should do commercial art. And so she seemed to be able to assess both the nature of the person and equate that with their talent and be able to channel people into, into doing the right thing for them. And gradually through the years, I've learnt to see it in their eyes. Uh, their eyes have a sort of dreamy, yet clear look, and they're usually very deep. And I can almost tell an artist almost as I see them, but the, they still doesn't say they're going to do it because they have to have purpose and they have to... Being challenged is only one thing. The desire to do it is the thing you're after, and the strength of their character to be able to fulfil that going right through their life. The student who excelled after being taught by Yvonne was Royal New Zealand ballet star John Trimmer. I was about 14, and I was going to Wellington Technical College, and in my second year there, she was one of the art teachers. A very loud woman, loads of energy, very energetic. Being a rather young 14, I was terrified of her, absolutely terrified. And, uh, she was a very wonderful woman, she was very kind to me. And especially looking back now, um, a couple of things, two things. I think she opened up my imagination to um, all sorts of things. Um, from bringing together various things from out of the sky, uh, prehistoric monsters and, and odd things like that. Uh, the other thing really which still lingers with me is her sense of colour. I can always hear her saying, don't use muddy colours, no muddy colours. Big booming voice. <laughs> stage I feel her influence not only with the colour work, uh, the colour, that's costumes, uh, lighting especially, but also with the perspective. On stage we work with a lot with perspective, judging how far I am upstage, downstage, away from the audience, that sort of thing. This is what she would have taught me anyway as a child at school. A dancer's professional life is normally short. You need to develop other skills in the world of ballet. John Trimmer now delights in more dramatic roles, like this mad preacher in The Witch Boy. here with Yvonne Rupp and it's a special quality. It's just a matter of strength I think you keep on going if, if things um, suddenly we're surrounded by blank walls you push through them. Being in, in a small country we tend to lose our individuality very easily quickly but uh, if you've been taught to find that center I think you can smash through whatever's there. School art today is much more creative than 30 years ago. Space and equipment have improved, and Yvonne's unconventional methods of teaching are now more acceptable. Children call them field trips. I taught them by doing the things with me. It's not the hours in class you spend with children, it's the hours out of class, after you've captured their imagination and given them purpose, they come with you in the after hours and do things that you're doing and they get uh, ideas beyond the school. You don't teach art, you lead from the back saying, yes, that's good or no, that's going the wrong way. If they're working correctly, then you just leave them and they go on. 
like another boy from her Hastings school who took the academic road to art. Ted Bracey is now senior lecturer in art education at Ireland, the School of Fine Arts at Canterbury University. Yvonne's function essentially was twofold. She, first of all, uh, made up for the inequities that conventional education uh, normally uh, involves itself in by um, taking people who, whose background uh, normally precluded them from any association with the arts uh, revealed to them that there was a life of art and revealed to them further that they had the abilities to uh, make a life for themselves in the life of art. And the second thing she did, which I think is probably more important because there was a stage in her life when she uh, got out of conventional education systems and she began developing alternative education systems. These grew from her love of pottery, fired by Robert Field in 1948. But no further training was available. So out of frustration, eight years later, she reacted in typical rust fashion. Well, I was interested in pottery, and I couldn't find anywhere to learn. Other people were interested in pottery. So I decided, seeing I was working with adult education, to organize a pottery school. That first National Pottery School became a prototype for workshops like this one in Northland 30 years later, bringing art into the community. Merrick's music taught us both. Uh, I would say that the enthusiasm that Yvonne started uh, in Christchurch, has, she has managed to uh, carry on for all these years and of course inspired so many people throughout the country. Not just potters, but other people who have been involved in other arts like painting, uh, weaving, carving, uh, but uh, I would say probably Poppers was the most, as uh, a group that was most benefiting from her enthusiasm and encouragement. They hovered after the first school of pottery and so I felt I had to go on and teach. At my former pottery school, this developed into a much bigger thing and I brought the idea of design, taking design out to the industries around Christchurch. And the first private design studio in Christchurch was established while Yvonne was still teaching for the education department. I that he worked 19 hours a day, seven days a week for 10 years. During that time, over 400 people enrolled at the studio, where Warren Tippett, now working in Australia, was her first pottery student. But being ahead of her time had one major problem. I couldn't get recognition from the authorities. I got n no help from the art school. Uh, I tried to get um, the government to approve of the studio of design. It's impossible. I tried to get money from QE2, and I was teaching amateurs, and they wouldn't let me. And that's a joke today. And then I had, Hamada came to New Zealand and I had the only oil-fired kiln in Christchurch and he chose to work in my studio. When Hamada, the famous Japanese popular, visited New Zealand, I think it was about 1965, Iwan really provided the most marvelous platform to project the philosophy of this man who has been inspirator of potters all around the world. I was fortunate enough to take part in all this and fired all his pots that he has made in Christchurch at the time. So it was a marvelous experience for all of us, for New Zealand potters. And Yvonne was really truly responsible for that happening here. When he pots, it's exactly like watching a religious ceremony. He has the swing you, the incense. There's not one movement that is unnecessary. And his fingers don't get dirty above the second ring. Mm -hmm. He worked so perfectly that I felt inadequate. He made you feel as though you were inadequate. And I sat and looked at the last 10 years of m uh, what I'd achieved and I decided it was pretty feeble and so I packed up in Christchurch and went to the west coast to save my raw materials. 
Over the next five years, Yvonne Rust did find herself as a potter. She taught in Greymouth and ran the student hostel. She developed the firm belief that we must produce truly indigenous art, and the West Coast had everything she needed. Looking back, that hasn't changed. It's a very strong place. It's the home of all raw materials in New Zealand. It's a place, it's really a young man's country, not an old lady's country. The West Coast is riddled with raw materials and therefore I wanted to go there to work with them and get the people interested in their own raw materials instead of plastics coming from overseas and cotton coming from overseas and everything coming from overseas and then being built into a work of art and then being exported. If I had had a lot of money at the right time, I would have built a, a tech, school of technology for raw materials because for 40 years I've been on a soapbox about raw materials and it has not happened and it still hasn't happened. Rui Alley has done for China what I would have liked to have done for New Zealand but we are so affluent that we don't care, we're not poverty stricken and therefore not, we're not grabbing at the things that are around us and using them to advantage he needed miners' rights for these raw materials and failed to get them. But she did succeed in another field, once again as a teacher. For West Coasters, what she really gave us was an insight into another world. And she did for me anyway. An insight to a world of art, of culture, of interesting people. She had always had interesting people around her. You know, people like Olivia Spencer Bauer and Tao Schoon. These were people who came to the brewery and you could hang around there as a 15-year-old boy and sit in the background and listen to all these interesting conversations by people who were really fired up. I mean, they were great people. And it was to this dilapidated brewery those people came. Here, she created a working studio that was the beginning of the West Coast pottery movement. When I worked in the brewery, with the environment outside, the silence within the brewery poured into my work. So that finally, after five years, when I came out and had an exhibition of my work, I realised that I was quite different from anybody else. I'd found myself at last. When people came to visit, they all sat along here, and the light of the sun would stream through the holes in the back of the room down there like fairy lights, you know. And the pink smoke from the kiln firing would go up it's very beautiful in here. And one night, Teo Schoon was here with his Javanese drums. He played through the firing, and that was quite an exciting night. But all our nights were experiences, and so it became important to people who were learning. Mm. These West Coasters were her students 16 years ago. Now they're all successful craftspeople, earning a living from the raw materials she came here to save. When Yvonne arrived, there were few professional artists working on the coast. No craft shops or galleries. Today, that's all changed. A visit to the Funakaiki Arts Cooperative provides the excuse for a party and a chance to relax and catch up with the gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne has been blessed with something I would call infectious enthusiasm. She enthuses all the people that are around her. John Crawford sculpted forms and painted pots now find a ready market here and overseas. He's one of the guest potters at the New Zealand Expo Pavilion in Brisbane. Roger Ewer, now on the Regional Arts Council, worked with Yvonne in Christchurch. She invited him to assist her at the brewery. He's been here ever since. Adrian Hewlett grew up here in Funakaiki and is now a member of the Professional Arts Cooperative. As a third former of boarding at the hostel, Yvonne inspired her to take up a career in art. Bruce Williams started potting in Britain and Canada. Returning to the Wairapa, he was told, 
go west young man to write. He did, and became a successful fox. Ian Beatrice is a greenstone carver. A fourth generation west coaster, Yvonne taught him to understand the natural world. He now has his own greenstone plane and exhibits not only in New Zealand, but in Sydney and Hawaii as well. Hardy Browning was a coal miner in his 50s when he first met Yvonne. Faced with redundancies through the closure of the Dobson mine, he and nine other miners were taken on by Yvonne's train of potters. At the brewery in this early film, Hardy Browning receives extra tuition from master potter Barry Brickle, who helped Yvonne build this coal-fired kiln. They fired only West Coast clay and glazes. Nothing imported was used. On that crash course, Hardy learnt his skill. Yvonne had created another working pot. We'd work till quite late at night and then full days at the weekend. And she was really drumming it into us. On the weekend, uh, she would take us out to find clay. And uh, some of the places that she went to, there's one place in particular between here and Blackpool, it was between two layers of gravel and a little bit of clay like this. And terrible stuff to make a pot out of. And uh, I overheard her saying one day, I'll sort the men out from the boys, have some slot. <laughs> so we, uh, we battled away with that clay for quite a long time, but it... I think it really paid off in the end because it's something like the cricketer teaching the kids. They don't teach them with cricket bats, they teach them with pick handles, you know? And I think giving us this hard, really hard clay to work with was really good for us, you know? There's no doubt about it, she organized the whole Potter Society and everything and really got things going. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's Yvonne right. has now completed 30 years teaching for the education department. And over that time, she developed a deep conviction about what makes an artist. Artists must live in an environment that hammers their inner consciousness, because that is where your creative side comes from. Art, for me, is the creative side of any form of medium. That means no matter what you do, even if it's bulrushes or clay, it's the thoughts that go behind it. That's art. The skill and the ability to do good work is craft but the art is the ideas and the creativeness and the difference from everybody else. After so long away from the North, it was time to return. Because my roots are in the North and my aura is in the North and I had to go home to paint. I flew over Tauranga and looked down and saw the mangroves. I knew that I had to come home because that meant home to me. And as I went north from Tauranga flying, all the mangroves grew taller and taller. And on landing in Wangarei, there they were. And this area is my heritage, and it's the aura I have inside me that belongs to New Zealand. And if you want to get that into your art, it has to be something that's really part of you, and you know your background. You can't just paint any old view and put the soul into it. On this site in Tauraroa Bay, she built a hay barn studio and the house she'd always wanted. An artist's house made from store of cement with glazed brick walls and railway sleepers for the floor. Every inch hand edged by Yvonne herself. She was awarded a Kiwi 2 Fellowship for her services to the arts, but the $2,500 did little to relieve the financial stress she was under. Money was also a problem establishing the Northland Craft Trust in this quarry at Bongaret. 
Devon's vision was to establish a resource center for Northland war materials. But with no money, she used the PEP scheme to train young people. But the schemes were too short, getting money too difficult, and the stress too great. She suffered a stroke. My stroke was in the middle of when I was teaching the unemployed in Wangarei. I woke up one morning and I felt butterflies in my head and they were trying to get out and I fell out of bed. Side was gone and I thought I'm having a stroke. So I drove slowly into Wangarei and went reported to the hospital to find confirm that I had a stroke. And when I went to write my name in the book, my pencil went round and round and round. So it developed all that day. And from then on, I was very upset. And I was in the throes of getting the studio. I didn't have it, didn't have the quarry. Everything was in a very crucial stage. And I just became very determined. And I m walked holding on to things. And, and I drew or scribbled with a pencil until I got more and more control of it. And I actually reverted to pidgin English, which was what I spoke when I was young. And then it became slowly back, within three weeks I'd left hospital and within six weeks I was back in the quarry and then they tried to put me on the scrap heap but I wouldn't go and, and so I worked there for another two years until I had uh, got the money from internal affairs and the council to buy the quarry. Now the quarry is established as a working environment for artists. Yvonne runs the annual summer school and teaches soil cement techniques that have now become an accepted method of building overseas. This physical labor would daunt other people half her age, but she still has the drive to work. I learned that life was urgent, that you were not to be under stress because I was under a real stress at the time. So I sold and got rid of all my stress. You have to have a new direction. You can't just sit back and wait for the stroke to go. And that was painting for me. I'd wanted to do it all my life. As a small child, she came to Spirit's Bay on horseback with her father. The landscape remained in her memory. It means a very special place when I was a child. And it means spiritual renewal now that I'm older. And it's an inspiration to art and it's a truly New Zealand landscape without any houses, without anything that's human. Telephone posts, telephone wires, it, there's nothing that makes me feel there are people in New Zealand. When you've been working hard, every now and again you need to have a renewal of the mind to be able to go off in another stance, take another angle in life, or take another direction in your artwork. And you have to cleanse out what you've got in you at the time. And you come up here and all the past goes away and you get into a new thought. All the techniques she had taught others she now applied to herself. In 1986, for this work, she won the National Bank Award at the Academy of Fine Arts in Wellington. Aptly, Kate Deanna has become the focus for her latest painting. My Maori background and knowing all their stories and know knowing how they felt and living in Tihapua where the Maoris are the guardians of this and hearing so many stories about it, that it's gone into me right deep down. You can actually feel the same sensation as when I was a child. 
I'm trying to capture the pathway to the next world. And I feel the next world is just our spirit world. Our spirit goes on into the next world. It's the only thing we've got that will go on. All her teaching life, she's growled at her pupils to put their soul into their work. Now she's discovering just how hard that is. I'm not really satisfied, but I think you never are. It's very hard to be satisfied when you're painting. I've painted 25, and they are getting a little deeper. You know, and by the time I've done 100, I just might do what I want to do. The energy which Yvonne Rush used to fire council students, which brought art into the community, is now channeled towards retraining herself. You have to relearn up here in my brain with a blank. And that's the dead bit of it. You know where it is. You can feel it there. And you have to train another part of your brain to remember the things and to do the things and your direct memory just... You don't seem to be able to get that back. You don't remember things from now to then in, in five minutes' time, names and things like that. How do you cope with that? I just look like an idiot. <laughs> and everybody excuses it. <laughs> what a woman. And next month, 16 years after Yvonne Rust pleaded for a school of technology on the West Coast, the first students will walk into the brand new West Coast Polytech in Greymouth. Well, that's all for this week. Next week, we'll be...